Welcome to the Compounding Center Connections Podcast, where we talk about different health conditions with our partnered practitioners. I'm your host, Jay Gill, a compounding pharmacist from the Compounding Center in Leesburg, Virginia. At the Compounding Center, we collaborate with practitioners, create custom medications to help our patients get better. So in today's episode, our guest is Dr. Nathan Bryan. He's an international leader in molecular medicine and nitric oxide biochemistry. He's the founder of a product called N101 nitric oxide lozenges. And today's episode, the title is Nitric Oxide and Its Benefits. I kind of want to take a with everyone that uh, last summer I was at a conference, a longevity conference, where we're where we are there to learn about how to what to do to live long. And I, Dr. Brian, presented uh, during that conference, and I thought it would be great for to have him as a guest and share this information with us. So, welcome, Dr. Brian. Please introduce yourself uh, to the listeners uh, and viewers. Thanks, Jay. It's great to be with you, and good to see you again after the uh, Red Fist yeah. question. So yeah, my, I, you know, as you mentioned, I've been in the nitric oxide molecular medicine field for about 25 years. I um, got an undergraduate degree in biochemistry. From there, I went to LSU School of Medicine, where I got a PhD in molecular physiology. Then went to Boston Medical Center, trained in vascular biology and cardiology, really on the effects of nitric oxide in, in vascular health and, and heart function. Uh, then I was recruited by Fred Murad, one of the gentlemen who shared the Nobel Prize in 1998 for the discovery of nitric oxide at the Institute of Molecular Medicine, which was part of the University of Health Science Center and Medical School in Houston. And it was there that I started my independent career. We made a lot of discoveries, uh, filed a number of patents. And to make a long story short, we figured out how to make nitric oxide, because nitric oxide is a gas that's naturally produced in the body. Once it's produced, it's gone in less than a second. So Mm -hmm. the challenge has been, how do we, number one, recognize patients who are nitric oxide deficient? And then number two, provide a safe and effective therapy or product technology that could restore and recapitulate nitric oxide production and signaling. So that's that's really the, my work over the past 20 years is, you know, we were the only people to make a solid dose form of nitric oxide gas in the form of a lozenge. We've, you know, expanded out. We've got skincare products now. We've got going into phase three clinical trials for a number of different uh, medical indications from ischemic heart disease, Alzheimer's, and topical drugs for diabetic ulcers. So, you know, this is where um, uh, I recommend nitric oxide to my patients with erectile dysfunction. And at that conference, I learned that it's just not about just ED. It's, it's got, uh, it's a very useful tool to use for, to live longer, especially helping us with those conditions that are going to help us age quicker. And this is where um, I think it's such a helpful tool that everyone should be taking this supplement on a daily basis, in my opinion. But uh, let's take a little bit, go back to some basics. And could you share with us what is nitric oxide and how does our body produce it? Yep. Well, the short answer is it's a signaling molecule. It's how cells in the body communicate with one another. But it's unlike any other signaling molecule because as I mentioned earlier, it's a gas. And so once it's produced, it finds its act, its receptor relates and activates a number of second messenger systems. And it's most recognized as a vasodilator. And that's where, you know, obviously its role in erectile dysfunction comes in because when we dilate the blood vessels, we can allow more blood flow and engorgement into the sex organs to allow for erections in both men and women. So when your body loses the ability to make nitric oxide, you no longer get the vasodilation, you don't get engorgement in the sex organs, and that's really the physiological basis for erectile dysfunction in men and women. But we know it's involved in in a number of different uh, signalisms. It's it's how our immune system fights off invading pathogens. It kills bacteria, kills viruses. Uh, It's antifungal, and it's uh, it's a neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. It's how you know some of our neurons and and cells in the in the brain and central nervous system communicate and, and signal. So when you lose the ability to make nitric oxide, you get a number of symptoms, as you may imagine. You become immunodeficient, you get erectile dysfunction, your blood pressure goes up, uh, you start developing memory problems, mild cognitive disorders, vascular dementia, if not corrected, full-blown Alzheimer's. So that's kind of the really the fundamental roles of nitric oxide. And 
you know, go back 30, 35 years, we really didn't understand how the human body made nitric oxide. Today, we know that there's two primary pathways. There's an enzyme in the lining of the blood vessels uh, in our endothelial cells. And that enzyme is what is responsible for the production of nitric oxide. And that's really the second to second regulation of blood flow and circulation and what regulates tissue oxygenation to every organ, tissue, and cell in the body. So this enzyme, the, really the first pathway to be discovered, converts L-arginine, which is an amino acid, okay. a semi-essential amino acid, into nitric oxide. And it's a, a very complex reaction. But it's really the dysfunction of that enzyme that leads to this age-related loss of nitric oxide production. And then about 15, 20 years ago, we discovered that there are bacteria that live in your mouth on the crypts of the tongue that are responsible for con a molecule called inorganic nitrate that's found in green leafy vegetables into active nitric oxide metabolites that can regulate systemic blood pressure. So now both pathways can compensate for the other, but when you lose the ability to make nitric oxide from both pathways, that's when you know you start to see the onset of symptoms and the rapid progression of disease if we don't correct it. So, uh, so that's a great segue now. You know, you uh, like uh, what happens when you stop making it or make less of it? What are some consequences of it? Uh, of or how do you even recognize it? That's right. Well, today we know that there's a hierarchy of symptoms. So the first really sign and symptom of loss of nitric oxide production <clears throat> is not coincidentally erectile dysfunction, because. So the, the sex organs are not only well vascularized, but they're innervated with what called non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic nerve endings. Mm. And there's a NOS enzyme, an enzyme that produces nitric oxide in the nerve endings and in the endothelial cells. So when we become stimulated or aroused, the natural response is to produce nitric oxide so you can get dilation and get engorgement for an erection in both men and women, a penile or, or a clitoral erection. And so if you if the blood vessels can't make nitric oxide, then you don't get the smooth muscle relaxation, you don't get the vasodilation, and, and again, that's the basis for erectile dysfunction. But if you have what we call endothelial dysfunction in the vascular bed of the sex organs, then it's not just isolated to that particular organ. That means you've got endothelial dysfunction in the coronary arteries, in the, in the cerebral arteries, in every blood vessel that supplies every tissue and cell in the body. So you've probably heard this, that erectile dysfunction is what we call the canary in the coal mine, right? It's really a sign and symptom of nitric oxide deficiency. And it's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, for early death. So that's usually the first sign and symptom. Number two is you start to see an increase in blood pressure. So when you lose the main molecule that's responsible for vasodilation, now you have the same volume of blood going with much tighter constricted arteries and your blood pressure goes up. And then you start to develop metabolic disease. You know, we published in 2009 that nitric oxide is part of the insulin signaling pathway. So when insulin is secreted from the pan pancreas, binds to the insulin receptors, that stimulates the cell to make nitric oxide that would then induce glu trans poor translocation, glucose uptake, and, and regulation of blood sugar. But if the cell can't make nitric oxide, then you develop insulin resistance. Hmm. So now you've got hyperinsulinemia, hyperglycemia, and really the, the inflammation that results from insulin resistance occurs systemically. And then, you know, people start to exercise intolerance. They get short of breath. They can't, you know, work out even moderate for 20 or 30 minutes. Start to lose memory, vascular dementia, and Alzheimer's. So if you have any of those signs or symptoms, then that really what that tells us is that your body's compromised in its ability to make nitric oxide, and you must take steps to restore it, or else you're on a very slippery slope. Okay. so. Um, everybody wants to know now, you know, how do we restore it? But I do want you to touch upon three things. I remember just being wowed by your presentation when you talked about MTHFR, uh, yep. oral microbiome, and the acid in our stomach that I'd, I'd love for you to touch on those points and how to restore nitric oxide, because I think everybody needs to know that. No, for sure. So once we understood how the human body makes nitric oxide, we understood the mechanism of action, we understood kind of mechanistically how that pathway works, then we can start to interrogate, okay, what are people doing that's interrupting with these production pathways? <clears throat> and so we'll, we'll take each of those three. So the MTHFR is, is 
what's called the tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme. And it's estimated that 45 to 55% of Americans have what's called a single nucleotide polymorphism. And we call this a SNP, which means that there's, there's an error in the coding region of that enzyme. So you can either have one bad copy or worst case scenario, two bad copies. And so for years, people have thought this is a methylation issue, which it is because it's part of the methylation cycle. But what people don't realize in biochemistry that there's substrates that feed into different uh, you know, biochemical reactions. And the MTHFR is what's responsible for producing tetrahydrobiopterin to the NOS enzyme. And so without an active MTHFR, you don't have reduced BH4, which is the rate limiting step in nitric oxide production. So I know that's very complex biochemistry, but to make it long story short, if you have an MTHFR SNP, then your body's compromised in its ability to make nitric oxide. You need to provide the body with a source of nitric oxide. And then the other SNP we worry about, obviously, is the SNP in the ENOS enzyme or, or in the isoform of NOS. Then obviously, then that compromises your ability to make it enzymatically. But then if we move on to the oral microbiome, you know, we're finding that people use mouthwash, which is two out of three Americans wake up every morning and use mouthwash, destroy the microbiome, shuts down nitric oxide production. We see an increase in blood pressure and all explained by a loss of nitric oxide. So if you're using mouthwash, you have to stop. I mean, mouth, I don't get it. You know, <laughs> you don't take an antibiotic every day for the rest of our life because of the known collateral damage the antibiotics have on destroying the microbiome. And people get sick. Without a healthy microbiome, it causes systemic disease. So why would you take an anesthetic mouth rinse every day to destroy the oral microbiome? And there's clinical consequences. We're just now starting to understand this, but the last thing you want to do is destroy the microbiome and especially disrupt the nitric oxide production. So you have to get rid of mouthwash and you have to stop using fluoride toothpaste. Because fluoride's an antiseptic. More than that, neurotoxin and it shuts down your thyroid function. So throw the fluoride out, uh, deny the fluoride risk at your or the fluoride rinses at your dentist. Fluoride's a poison, it's a toxin, yeah. and it should be completely avoided. And then the third, as you mentioned, Jay, was the proton inhibitors. These are a specific class of antacids that, you know, they were never approved by the FDA to be used chronically, but yet you can buy these meds now over the counter and people have been taking them every day for 10, 15, 20 years. And again, there's consequences to that. A study published in 2015 showed that people who had been on PPIs, these are your Prevacid, your Prilosec, your Omeprazole, Pantoprazole, uh, People who had been on those drugs for three to five years had a 40% higher incidence of heart attack and stroke because they're completely shutting down nitric oxide production. Wow. Another study published late last year is people on proton pump inhibitors for at least three years had about a 40% higher incidence of Alzheimer's. So again, if you, if you disrupt nitric oxide production, you lose the regulation of blood flow, your blood pressure goes up, you develop vascular dementia, Alzheimer's, heart attack, stroke, so you have to get patients off of antacids. Your body cannot and will not heal without stomach acid production. And antacids are a dangerous drug. They should be avoided. Uh, you know, this is worse than the Vioxx and Celebrex of, of 20 years ago, you know, where these Cox, specific COX-2 inhibitors were known to cause heart attack strokes. And, you know, they were taken off the market. Now I think there's a black box warning on them. The same thing should, should be for proton pump inhibitors. They're not safe. Uh, not increased risk, it's actually increased events, heart attacks, strokes, and Alzheimer's. 100% agree with you. My gosh. Um, thanks for sharing, uh, touching upon those two point, uh, three points. Um, yeah. Could you now uh, talk to us about uh, your nitric oxide product and are there any side effects also, obviously, by taking uh, anyone taking any nitric oxide products? Yep. Well, first, let me state by saying there's hundreds of nitric oxide products on the market. Yeah. And I think this is a very dangerous proposition, not because the products, some, they're probably safe, some of them are not safe, but more importantly, they don't do anything. And I think that could kill an entire industry because when patients say, oh, I've taken nitric oxide and it didn't do anything for me, I didn't get better, it didn't improve my ED, it didn't improve my blood pressure. And that's dangerous because it could kill an entire field. I think one of the most important fields in the future of medicine. So what we do is completely different. You can't give your body amino acids or substrates and hope your body can convert it because the basis of people that have nitric oxide deficiency is the enzyme that converts arginine to nitric oxide isn't functional. 
So any product that contains arginine or citrulline is basically useless. Mm -hmm. These are semi-essential amino acids, meaning that we get it from the breakdown of protein, but these amino acids are made through the urea cycle, so they're naturally produced at a flux that's sufficient to more than saturate the binding side of the enzyme. So there's no supplement arginine or, or citrulline. The other products out there are beetroot products, right? Beets became kind of a hero vegetable back in the early 2000s, 2012 Olympic Games. I've tested all these beet products, probably 95, 99% of the beet products on the market don't do anything in terms of nitric oxide. Now they'll turn your urine pink and red and, and your, your feces and cause a lot of anxiety. People think they've got bleeds or you know, bladder infection. <laughs> but there's absolutely no nitric oxide activity whatsoever on these products. So, and again, there's companies selling gummies and chews of beets, and it's 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 nonsensical. And it would be funny if it wasn't dangerous. And so I just tell consumers to beware. So here's what we do that's different. So we understand what goes wrong in people that can't make nitric oxide. So we provide nitric oxide for them. If your body can't make it, then we do it for you. And that's the base of our lozenge. You put the lozenge in your mouth. It dissolves over five to six minutes. And as it's slowly dissolving, we're liberating, you know, 30 to 40 parts per million. You know, gas. So we want to deliver a certain amount of nitric oxide over a certain period of time so that it's buccally absorbed. We swallow our saliva, we get nitric oxide in the lumen of the stomach, and it becomes systemic. So we've done full pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics on this technology. It's not only safe, but it's very effective. So that's if your body can't make nitric oxide, then we do it for you. And number two, because we understand the enzymology and the biochemistry of the enzyme found in the lining of the blood vessels, we can actually recouple that enzyme and make it functional again. So now we can improve the body's ability to make nitric oxide on its own, which is critically important. And then number three, because it's an orally disintegrating tablet that resides on the tongue and you move it around for five to six minutes, it's destroying the bad bacteria because opportunistic pathogenic bacteria are sensitive to nitric oxide. Wow. And then the non-pathogenic commensal bacteria love nitrogen as a source because they're facultative anaerobes, and when they run out of oxygen, they can expire on nitrogen. So what we're finding today is that the lozenge restores the oral microbiome, repopulates the good bacteria, and now your body is trying to make nitric oxide on its own. So that, that's the difference between what we do and all these other companies and charlatans out there trying to sell you schlocky products without any science behind it. And it's really, it's not only deceptive, but in many cases, it's fraudulent. So uh, could you touch upon most recently the thing about that, you know, nitric oxide products are full of high oxalates. And, and that's the most recent, uh, you know, social media trend discussion. Give us the truth. What is it, uh, you know, oxalates and beetroot powder and your product? Well, oxalates are found in most vegetables. Uh, particularly the green leafy vegetables, kale, spinach, arugula, beet. So in people who are sensitive to oxalic acid, it can it can lead to keystones and gallstones if your body's not able to process that, or if you just take too much of this. So there's obviously there's different patients that have different sensitivities to to oxalates, but of course nobody wants to have a kidney stone. It's very painful and and susceptible to other stones, whether it's gallstones or any of that. So oxalates really should be avoided. So in all these companies that are selling beetroot powder, inherent in that beetroot or these vegetable powders that are enriched in nitrate are oxalates or oxalic acid. So that's the danger. And for me, it's always risk benefit. What's the risk of that product versus the benefit? And what we've learned through testing is there's really no benefit at all from these beet powders or gummies or chews. The risk is you're getting these oxalates and it could form kidney stones. So what we do with our lozenge there's no oxalates in there. We don't. We use basically natural product chemistry and, and things that the body's used to seeing. Uh, so there's no oxalates in any of our products. We do make a fermented beet powder called NO beets, okay. where we intentionally remove the oxalates. So we take the beet pulp, the beet powder, the beet taste, uh, the oxalates out of it. So we have a very nice, good tasting beet powder uh, that delivers nitric oxide but doesn't contain any oxalates. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, the, I want to share with you um, next uh, thing, um, you know, most recently, probably in the last year to year and a half, you know, I work with a lot of, uh, I partner with a lot of ENTs, and uh, I would always get the call that, Jay, I'm seeing a lot of patients with loss of smell. What could you do 
you know, and it's part of, it's one of the symptoms of long COVID and uh, what could you do? And, you know, and trying to figure out how to gain, some, uh, you know, patients to gain their sense of smell back and it takes a long period of time. And, you know, there's some nasal sprays that we make and anti-inflammatory in nature, you know, that's how they work. And, yeah. and at the pharmacy, we added the nitric oxide to our protocol. And, and that's where the idea came from. Let's increase the perfusion, the, you know, of blood flow and the nerve to connect and reduce inflammation. Do you have any uh, thoughts on long COVID symptoms and how nitric oxide could help with long COVID symptoms? Absolutely. So that, that mechanism is, is fully elucidated. We've learned a lot over the past four years on the the onset, the susceptibility of certain patients to COVID and really the susceptibility to long COVID, the, the systemic symptoms that persist long after the active infection is gone. So we'll, we'll go through this because it's a very important mechanism. Spike protein that's found on the COVID virus binds to the ACE receptors, right? And then the ACE receptors are what brings it into the cell, which it hijacks our nucleus and then rapidly proliferates and replicates the virus. And then it goes along the entire blood vessels, the vascular system, and it causes vascular inflammation. You get an upregulation of ACE2 receptors, which then cause monocytes and neutrophils and platelets to start sticking the lining of the blood vessels. Platelets aggregate, your body tries to break it down to prevent clot formation that causes an elevation D-dimers. And so it's really the vascular inflammation that's really the root cause of long COVID. Mm. And people forget, you know, just like the olfactory nerve, all nerves in the body are perfused by small blood vessels. So in those very small, the microvasculature in the capillaries, that are feeding these nerves, they become clogged because the blood vessels become like Velcro and they're stick and there's very little blood flow getting through. Then those nerves can elicit an action potential and do their job. So not only develop neuropathy, you develop loss of, of cell and a lot of sensory neurons become compromised. So what do we got to do? We got to give nitric oxide, which by the way, downregulates the ACE2 receptor. So there's no target for the spike protein to bind to. We prevent the upregulation of other adhesion molecules. And we prevent monocytes, neutrophils, and platelets sticking to the lining of the blood vessels. So now you've got an open highway where the blood can get through. You don't have, you mitigate the inflammation. Now you can perfuse all organs, tissues, and cells in the body, including the nerves, uh, the olfactory nerve, for example, or sensory or motor neurons and nerves in the periphery. So nitric oxide completely gets to the root cause of, of any type of neuropathy, not just neuropathy related to long COVID, but any any symptom or or syndrome that may be associated with vascular inflammation and basically that's the root cause of most if not all chronic disease wow that's a great uh, uh, that's a great point you just made well dr brian thank you for joining us today you shared a wealth of information um now how could someone reach out to you or even you know uh go to purchase your products that you have well, Jay, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to share this information. But, you know, I'm not here to sell products. I'm here to provide education and, and awareness around nitric oxide and really give your listeners the information so that they can make informed decisions and not be duped by a lot of these commercials they see on, on TV. So the first place I send people is to my YouTube channel. We'll probably post this podcast on my YouTube channel. It's Dr. Nathan S. Bryan, Nitric Oxide. We do podcast interviews uh, and really some lectures to educate and inform. Secondly, you can go to drnathansbryan.com. It's an educational website. I do a monthly blog. There's some videos on there that'll inform you and, and give you a pretty good understanding of nitric oxide. And then for those that want, you know, product solutions, you know, based on my 25 years of science and research and, and access to products that actually work, that's at n101.com. That's www, the letter, the number one, the letter O, number one.com in one oh one dot com well i know the website you're talking about a wealth of information so i'm going to make sure we put both the n101 website and the other website information in our show notes okay um and thank you everyone for being into the compounding center connections podcast we hope you found this information presented today to be helpful please subscribe like or give us five star we're on all podcast channels and if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to me at j 
at compoundingcenter.com. Thank you, Dr. Brian. Thank you, Jay.